Neoconservative warmongers love the USS Abraham Lincoln. Remember that moment back on May 1st, 2003, where George W. Bush landed on the Abraham Lincoln in a warplane. He was wearing his flight suit, and then he proceeded to declare the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Mission accomplished. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. 16 years after that speech by Bush, Iraq remains in chaos and mired in bloodshed. There is a brutal war raging in neighboring Syria. Millions and millions of people remain displaced. It is a living nightmare, and it can be directly traced to the invasion of Iraq, the lies that were told, and this stunt that then President Bush pulled on the Abraham Lincoln. And then 16 years later, almost to the day, Donald Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton, announced that the Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group and a bomber task force were being deployed to, quote, send a clear and unmistakable message to the Iranian regime that any attack on the United States interests or on those of our allies will be met with unrelenting force. Iran subsequently accused the Trump administration of waging psychological warfare. Acting Defense Secretary Patrick Shanahan said the deployment was made because of a, quote, credible threat by Iranian regime forces. But he offered no details. Axios is reporting the threat is based on information passed on from Israel. Over the past two plus years, the Trump administration has become increasingly populated by radical extremists with multi-decade records of agitating for the overthrow of the Iranian government. These are people like John Bolton and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who believe that the 1953 overthrow of Iran's democratically elected leader, Mohammad Mossadegh, and the subsequent rule of the Shah was the high point of Iranian civilization. Iran should be an oil field with a flag and an impoverished, disempowered population. Attention is focused once again on the Middle East, where events in Iran have taken a dramatic double twist. Forced to free his palace in Tehran, the Shah and his queen arrive in Rome after an alleged attempt by the Imperial Guard to arrest Dr. Mossadegh and a refusal by the Shah to dissolve Parliament at Mossadegh's request. Now, with Donald Trump in power, a motley coalition has emerged involving Israel, the Saudis, Eric Prince, the Emiratis, members of the Trump family, all united in their goal to damage or destroy Iran. This is one of those issues that could explode in a moment based on a provocation or on outright lies. It is dangerous and it's incendiary. At the same time, Israel once again unleashed a deadly assault on Gaza over the weekend, killing at least 25 Palestinians, including two pregnant women and two children. Israel denies that it killed the women and blamed it on Hamas rockets. Four Israelis were also reported to have been killed. This recent round of killings began after Israeli forces reportedly shot and killed two Palestinian protesters, sparking lethal battles between Palestinians and Israeli military forces. On orders from Benjamin Netanyahu, fresh off his re-election, Israel bombed buildings and also used drones to fire a missile at a car it claimed was carrying a Hamas leader. While the Trump administration hammers away on the theoretical threat of a nuclear Iran, Israel has a full nuclear arsenal and the passionate backing of the Trump White House. This is perhaps one of the most dangerous situations we have seen in recent years in the broader Middle East region. Joining me now to discuss all of this is my colleague, Murtaza Hussein. He's a reporter for The Intercept. Maz, welcome back to Intercepted. Thank you for having me. What's going on in Iran right now? It, Is it the case that Bolton and Pompeo and others in the Trump administration actually want to go to war against Iran? Well, when you look at these situations, you have to understand that they're accomplished in stages. So the first stage, as you can see, is an attempt to degrade and ultimately cause the collapse of the Iran nuclear deal. I am announcing today that the United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. The second stage would be to build pressure on Iran economically. If it causes political divisions in Iran, all the better. We will be instituting the highest level of economic sanction. 
And then military conflict is something that happens later down the line. And you saw this previously with U.S. policy towards Iraq, which was preceded by decades of sanctions and other forms of pressure. I don't think the U.S. is looking for imminent war with Iran today, but it is setting the stage for that years down the line. And we're also in a very dangerous situation where there could be unintended escalations or confrontations between the Iranian military and the U.S. And the people who are really suffering in the moment are the civilians of Iran. Today's action sends a critical message. The United States no longer makes empty threats. When I make promises, I keep them. What has the impact been of the sanctions on Iran specifically? So sanctions on Iran specifically target its oil sector to try to reduce oil exports to zero in the statements of U.S. administration officials. The problem is that the heavy sanctions on Iranian banks have made it difficult for a lot of things which should get into Iran to get there. Companies and foreign banks do not want to deal with Iranian institutions because they're afraid of incurring fines and other penalties from the U.S., we're still at the early stage of these sanctions. As you know, Iraqi sanctions led to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of civilians. We're not there yet with Iran. But if you talk to people in Iran, the situation there is getting more dire month by month. People are having difficulties affording meat. They're having difficulties obtaining uh, medical supplies, which are critical to life. If this continues for many more months, many more years, you're going to see a very devastating civilian impact comparable somewhat to what we saw in Iraq. I think it's no mistake or not unintentional that Bolton makes this announcement that the U.S. is deploying the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group and a bomber task force to Central Command, and as he said, to send a clear and unmistakable message to the Iranian regime that any attack on United States interests or on those of our allies will be met with unrelenting force. Of course, he says this in early May, and the Abraham Lincoln was actually the carrier that George W. Bush stood on in front of his mission accomplished banner in May of 2003. It seems like the symbolism is not coincidental. There's a distinct lack of irony in these officials, and John Bolton, of course, is a major official from that era as well. This deployment, as far as we know, was a routine deployment, but it's being characterized for political purposes by Bolton as a unique threatening measure against Iran. And again, that in itself is dangerous. It's ratcheting up the tension. In Iran, there are hardliners who are seeking degradation of relations with the U.S. and the outside world for their own reasons. These measures and this rhetoric is empowering those people, and it's leading to a situation where you could see a naval conflict between the U.S. and Iran, which leads to a cycle of unintended consequences, which could lead to a war or strikes against Iran in the near future. If they were to push forward to this, we know everything we know about Pompeo, Bolton, all that crew, but also we've now observed Trump for a couple of years. How would this be sold? Well, after the Iraq war, there's clearly not a great appetite in the U.S. public for an occupation of a foreign country in the long term. I think the way this war would be sold is something close to Gulf War I, a very antiseptic from the U.S. standpoint conflict, airstrikes, drone strikes, uh, cruise missile strikes against Iranian targets. What you'd see is a lot of death and destruction on the Iranian side, but less exposure to physical risk by Americans. And I think that the way that military technology is developing is that we're going to move towards more of these hands-off wars, hands-off on one side at least. So there'll be bombings of Iranian cities, of Iranian military targets, maybe energy-producing facilities, nuclear facilities. But you will not see Trump or anyone else talking about major escalations of U.S. forces in the Saudi Iran. Maybe there'll be special forces raids, but it'll be a war which, to some degree, Americans will be able to ignore. That's the only way politically such an endeavor can be sold after the toxic events in Iraq. You know, one of the takeaways, I think, from this two and a half years of the Mueller Russia investigation is that there was this ongoing conspiracy of people within the Trump administration or the Trump family, interlocutors for Trump and foreign governments like Eric Prince or George Nader, and then foreign powers like the Saudis or the Israelis or Emiratis, who all seem to be united in wanting that Iranian regime to be overthrown. I really see the present uh, behavior by the U.S. as a form of unfinished business from the 2003 Bush era. Now you have people like Bolton back in power. You have people like Eric Prince in the orbit of the Trump administration. Many of the same voices who were very much wanted to see 
confrontation happening over a decade ago are now back near the helm of power. And all the same ideas and all the same ideologies and all the same desires for U.S. policy in the Middle East, they're back. And they have Trump. And I'm not saying that Trump himself is somebody who campaigned on a war with Iran, but in many ways he's a cipher for these extremist elements in the United States. And with him, they see an open door to achieving the dreams that were unfulfilled many years ago. And the Obama era was sort of a obstruction to that, and things like the Iran nuclear deal need to be pulled apart in order to achieve their goals, but they're working on that in earnest now. And if we see a second Trump administration, I think that the odds of confrontation with Iran militarily are very high. The noted academic Juan Cole, who also is an expert on Middle East politics and, and history, had a, a recent piece where he was talking about how CNN's Fareed Zakaria did a story about John Bolton, in which Zakaria depicted Bolton as just a very conservative man who sees the world as full of menacing enemies. Bolton has been variously described as a neoconservative, a paleoconservative, a conservative hawk. In fact, he is simply a conservative in the oldest, most classical sense someone who has a dark view of humankind. I want you to respond to the following characterization uh, from Professor Juan Cole. He says, this picture of Bolton is a complete misreading. Bolton is a sadistic bully who wants to dominate people. He never got to be more than temporary UN ambassador under George W. Bush because he had mercilessly tortured his office staff. Bolton likes to hurt people who are weaker than he. He is not after Iran because he's afraid of it. He's after it because it is one of the last countries in the world still bucking the U.S. power architecture and which is too weak to resist an all-out assault. He wants to see flies walking on the Iranians' eyeballs and wants even their dogs to be fucked. Look, uh, Fareed Zakaria is somebody who's part of a certain establishment in D.C. where he may see John Bolton around or he's part of a certain polite social set, which includes the most powerful people in the United States. So he chooses not to speak frankly about who these people really are. And look, the United States has extremists like any country has extremists. John Bolton is an inveterate extremist. He makes no secret about his desire for war. The declared policy of the United States of America should be the overthrow of the Mullah's regime in Tehran. The only solution is to change the regime itself. And that's why before 2019, we here will celebrate in Tehran. Thank you very much. John Bolton is somebody who looked at the past 10 years of horror in Iraq and did not feel sated by that. He wants more war in the region. And I think uh, Professor Cole's characterizations are absolutely correct. And, you know, we shouldn't speak about these people in diplomatic language. They deserve to be spoken about as war criminals, as putative war criminals. They're not repentant or shy about who they are, and we shouldn't be shy about describing them as they are. What's happening right now in Israel with a newly emboldened Netanyahu and these ongoing attacks on the Palestinians? It's a very interesting situation because I feel that Netanyahu, despite his rhetoric, he does not want to invade Gaza again. He does not want to have a major war. He's someone who's very risk-averse. And this practice that they have periodically of, quote-unquote, mowing the lawn, which is a term that they use, conducting airstrikes, killing maybe a few dozen Palestinians, having rockets come back the other way in some number. This is something which is politically convenient. It allows him to posture as somebody tough without taking the political risks which would entail and the casualties which would entail a major conflict. And in the end, what happens is that Hamas and Netanyahu have a mutually beneficial relationship to some degree. It's much more beneficial for Netanyahu, but he is able to portray himself as somebody tough on security. And meanwhile, in the end, to achieve these ceasefires, some concessions have to be given to, in terms of uh, loosening restrictions on Gaza. On the other hand, you have the West Bank, where no concessions are given because there's no violence in the West Bank on a mass level. And the message ultimately sent is that armed resistance will give some sort of concession and they'll have to deal with you on equal terms in some sense. Whereas the Palestinians who have chosen a political solution with Israel, they have no outlet for concessions. They're repeatedly humiliated. There's not even the pretense that restrictions are going to be lifted. And the situation continues on with no end in sight. I think that uh, in Gaza right now, the blockade's been going on for more than a decade. It's not anywhere close to ending. But for many forces, mainly in Israel, the status quo is something which is bearable.